Hi there, this is Bill Burrard saying welcome to adventure. True adventure filmed as it happens throughout our fascinating world. On this episode, I'm going to tell you of my own thrilling experience in Manila Bay. In truth, though, this story began long before I entered into it. It actually began in the dark days of World War II on the besieged island of Corregidor. After days of terrifying Japanese bombing, our defeat seemed inevitable. And fearing that a huge treasure in silver pesos would fall into enemy hands, General Douglas MacArthur ordered his men, carry it to sea, dump it into the depths of Manila Bay. Later, learning of the sunken treasure, the Japanese ordered U.S. Navy divers, their prisoners, go get it. Huh. But with typical American courage and ingenuity, the divers broke the boxes open on the ocean floor and scattered the coins. And then, innocently, they reported to the Japanese captors, take many, many months to recover the millions in coins. And so, day after day, the divers went to the bottom of that bay bringing up just as few coins as possible to the enemy, but they were smuggling other coins in their diving suits, smuggling coins to American prisoners, to guerrilla fighters. No writer of fiction could duplicate this dramatic story, which is recorded in the historic documents of World War II. I heard it from a Navy diver, and that's when I began my part of it. I enjoyed skin and scuba diving as an amateur sport, but now my imagination was fired. I decided to test my diving skill, going for sunken treasure. After months of research, I found myself at last diving in the waters of Manila Bay for part of nearly $20 million in silver pesos. Would I find it? Or would this long journey lead me to a dead end? This, then, is the story. The story I'll live for you as we search together for part of the sunken millions of Manila Bay. But as you're going to see, while I went seeking adventure, I, I actually found something else, a, an inner experience, you could call it something almost impossible to express. Now, I think you'll understand as you join me in uncovering Corregidor's secret. My true adventure found me entering the city of Manila, the heart and the hub of Filipino existence. Nowhere on the face of the globe will you find a more noble example of what is meant by American colonialism in the 20th century than here in the free islands of the Philippines. And nowhere will you find the scars of war still so self-evident. For it was here on this soil during World War II that the principles which America symbolizes were fought for and thankfully preserved. I went immediately to the Church of Santo Tomas to track down the story of Manila's sunken millions. I was told that the man I should see first was Father Jose Garcia, and I heard from his own lips of the terrifying days which American and Filipino prisoners endured here at Santo Tomas prison. He also verified that Navy divers did smuggle silver pesos, not only to the prisoners, but even more important, and in greater quantity, to the many Filipino guerrilla units hiding in the hills. As helpful as Father Garcia was, he wasn't able to furnish any specific information about where the coins could be located. For that, he suggested that I go to the presidential palace and see a man by the name of Senor Manuel Rodriguez. Special clearance is necessary to enter the palace, and with the help of the United States Council in Manila, I was able to make an appointment for the very next day. I found Rodriguez to be a very charming man, and in his official capacity as a special aide to the President of the Philippines, Rodriguez was instrumental in urging his government to take a gamble and go diving for much of the silver which supposedly was still lying at the bottom of Manila Bay. It was a gamble, Senor Rodriguez told me, which paid off quite handsomely. And it was encouragement enough to spur me on in my search like stepping stones. 
leading to a treasured chest. Rodriguez referred me to another gentleman, to a man by the name of Jim Warmack, one of the original men contracted by the Philippine government to recover the coins. Although the diving operation cost the government thousands of dollars, over two million dollars in silver coins were recovered. I knew now for certain the sunken millions were no myth. And further than that, this man was proof, dramatic proof, of the original 10 Filipino divers doing the diving. He was still alive. He was the sole survivor. All the rest, working at depths up to 120 feet, perished at the bottom of Manila Bay. Warmack, who has kept some of the recovered coins, told me he thought it was still possible to find silver money off the island of Corregidor. While I was doing the groundwork in Manila, the second part of our true adventure team, led by Bill Hogan of Long Beach, California, was flying into Manila Bay. It was Hogan who taught me the basic principles of skin and deep sea diving. And also it was Hogan, an expert in his field, who arranged with an old Navy friend of his to get a boat equipped with all the necessary diving gear. When Hogan pulled up to the pier in Manila Bay, I was there to greet him. He's very easily recognizable, by the way, with a, <laughs> a beatnik beard. This was the man in whose hands I would literally place my life during the adventurous and uncertain days ahead. Hogan's eyes lit up like a pinball machine when I showed him one of the recovered coins. When he looked skyward, however, the expression changed a bit. This was the heart of the typhoon season, a fact which I was well aware of, having been caught in several during World War II. Concerned about the weather and hopeful of bypassing strong winds, Hogan suggested we get underway immediately for Corregidor. Going aboard brought back a whole stream of wartime memories for me, memories of the destroyer on which I served in the Pacific. It had certainly had been a long time since I felt the salty deck beneath my feet. But now we were cutting the waters of Manila Bay, and as nostalgic as I may have felt, this man, Louis Goldstein, a veteran of the fall of Corregidor, had far more poignant and moving memories about the place than I did. I'd learn more about that as we reached the island itself. As we talked, the crewmen readied the special scuba equipment, which would soon be put to use. As in pirate days of yesteryear, we agreed among the fellas that if any loot was found, it would be divided proportionately among all hands. As near as we'd been able to figure out from all available data, we would do most of our diving between the island of Corregidor and toward the peninsula of Batan. Corregidor, which we're approaching now, lies about 40 miles out in the southwest corner of Manila Bay. Goldstein and I stood on the bow, looking for the first sight of the famed fortress. It'll loom up suddenly, the old sergeant said, as if it came out of nowhere. And so it did. This is Corregidor. And I was seeing it with a man who lived through one of the most dramatic and exhausting experiences of the entire Philippine campaign. For the last 30 days in the defense of Corregidor, Sergeant Goldstein and his fellow soldiers lived and died on this bleak, small island. Much of the time, they huddled together in this tunnel. 24 hours a day, the Japanese bombs rained down upon the sergeant and thousands of others serving under General Douglas MacArthur. 
Through it all, the Japanese showed no mercy. They came in their bombers, in their subs, in their aircraft carriers, and later their landing crafts. Goldstein was one of the luckiest. He lived, was taken prisoner. Today, he's the leader of an organization called the Defenders of Bataan and Corregidor. But this was the first time since the war that Goldstein walked again over this hallowed ground, every foot of which was so familiar to him. Can you imagine the thoughts that must have been going through his mind at this moment? Thoughts of despair and death, thoughts of brave comrades dying all around him, thoughts that could only be appreciated and fully understood by those who were there. For that reason, I remain silent during most of our walk together. Although the jungle is reclaiming much of the island, Corregidor today is a national shrine those who come here can still see the guns and the gaping walls, just as they were during the five-month siege by the Japanese. Everyone, as I did with Sergeant Goldstein, can have a real sense of living again through a tragic but glorious moment in American history. But at this point, Sergeant Goldstein pointed out to me where he, along with other soldiers, was ordered by MacArthur to dump the millions in silver pesos, to keep them out of the hands of the Japanese. So here we were, about to begin our very own search for the silver coins of Manila Bay. Although I tried not to show it, I was pretty nervous at this stage of the game. For Bill Hogan, who went over the side first, it was old hat. Bill has done this countless upon countless numbers of times. But for me, well, it was only my third dive. I'd always been a better than average swimmer and done my share of skin diving for abalone off the shores of California, Mexico, but diving for the silver of Manila Bay, that's another story. Obviously, it's far too late to turn back now. Check the equipment. Put on the mask. And over the sign. Down, down into a strange new world. What an experience this is. Your first reaction is confusion, almost disbelief. You just can't quite believe it's you swimming about in a blue-green world, wearing a thick rubber suit, carrying odd but vital equipment on your back. Fortunately, at the very beginning of our descent, we ran into some good luck. Right on target, we came across old wreckage, a ship sunk by the Japanese. Can you imagine the story it could tell, it could speak, in those desperate days in 1942? We used the old wreck as a point of reference. It's very difficult, as you know, if you've ever done any diving, to locate direction underwater. us the creatures of the undersea lurking in the wreckage.
Suddenly I saw a shark and a big one. Strange as it may seem, it sends a cold chill even though it's cold in the water up your spine. My eyes focused again on the wreckage before me. Now my mind was miles and years away to old comrades with whom I'd served on other ships and other days. Some of those too were resting on the bottom of the Pacific somewhere, while before me were the nautical ghosts of Corregidor. But after servicing, it was seemed pointless at this point to stay in this location. Nothing was found. Since time was becoming a very important factor and there was a possibility of a typhoon any moment, we decided to move along and see if we could find luck elsewhere. Again with Hogan at my side, I went down, this time as far as I dared to go. Of course, I was getting more confident now, more sure of my surroundings. I knew enough about diving and swimming not to get too overconfident. But again, the silent world unfolded before my eyes. Cormac had said the best place to try to find the silver coins was on a sandy bottom, and we began to find more sandy bottom. So far, of course, still no trace, glimmer of the precious coins. But because of the ever-changing surface, this was the only method, the only way we could use to try to uncover any of the hidden coins. Fan the bottom with the hand, thus There's much silt on the bottom at this depth from the typhoons and storms from the surface. But it was the same story, no luck. Our scuba gear, scuba meaning self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, was operating beautifully. We couldn't go as deep as some of the hard hat divers or stay as long, but we could maneuver much more easily and cover more ground. Topside, the crew was beginning to worry about us. We'd been at our new location for over an hour. We were getting tired and beginning to feel the strain. Furthermore, dusk would soon descend. If Dame Fortune was going to shine upon us, it would have to be now or perhaps never. It seemed a shame, really, to go through so much effort to be so near and yet so far. Discouraged, I was about ready to ask Bill to surface. Was it a coin? It certainly looked like it. I anxiously, I swam to the surface to show it to the crew and to verify for myself whether or not it was just a bogus coin or the real McCoy. Upon close inspection, we were positive and jubilant because it was authentic. But would there be any more where that came from? There's only one way to find out. Go back down. And along with me, send the bucket down. While I'd been on the surface, Hogan had remained on the bottom, marking the spot where we made the original discovery. When I returned to the bottom, we did find more coins, more than we had imagined more than we could handle in one bucket. You, you know, you have absolutely no idea of what a thrilling experience this is until you go through it yourself. 
every member of the crew was just as happy as a, and as excited as I was. In fact, speaking of excitement, the crew topside became so eager to quicken the pace that they almost set a full bucket of coins right back down to the bottom. Wait a minute, no, that's it. Save the coins. Yes, all this was part of the silver pesos dunked into the sea by the retreating forces of General Douglas MacArthur back in the year of 1942. Remained there on the bottom until this moment. And what a moment it was for each and every one of us. For me, of course, it was the end of a long journey and a long dream. Hours of research, tracking down a rumor and fact, the endless details and preparations and hopes that go into making a, an adventure film like this. We work faster and harder. And then we saw something else. A shark and a big one. Fortunately for us, apparently he wasn't in a fighting mood. But we didn't want a chance his return. And since our time and money had just about run out, we decided it was time to surface and call it quits. Our mission had been accomplished. Well, we hadn't struck it rich in a monetary sense. Only about, oh, 150 to 200 coins. But really, the actual money we, we recovered was only a small part of what we really wanted to find there. I felt the personal kind of satisfaction that all the money in the world couldn't buy. The satisfaction of doing what some had said was impossible, of recovering the sunken millions, or part of it anyway, of Manila Bay, and making it instead of merely a dream, a reality of true adventure. It was a wonderful true adventure, one I'll never forget. I even got some souvenirs, including this silver peso that I carry around with me. But you remember what I said earlier about having an experience that I could hardly put into words? Well, perhaps I can do it for you right now. You, you see, my adventure over there, my diving and going after the coins, it was nothing compared to what those men went through on that island. Standing on Corregidor was the most dramatic moment of my life because there it is today, just exactly as it was when our American servicemen held out to the end against the Japanese. And you can look at it. And to me, it, it stands as a symbol of courage and dedication and kind of love that we perhaps know nothing about. Time, the jungle, they're taking the island over but time must never dim our memory of what those great Americans did for us. And being there, standing on the island, seeing it for myself, was an experience few people can have. I'm grateful I had it. And I'm also grateful for something else, a new appreciation it gave me, a deep and a lasting appreciation of what my country, America, and its people stand for left me with a conviction that today or tomorrow or a year from now, if we have another Corregidor, we Americans can still take it. We'll come back to win again. Thank you. Until we meet once again, this is Bill Burrard saying, may all your adventures be happy ones.